Okay. Yeah. See, now you're making me paranoid because you're monkey with it. Yeah. It's still counting. Cool. Thank you. I think you just started a new one. Are you the video? Hello, all. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Half Price Books, and thank you, Linnea, wherever you are, for uh, organizing this. All right. So um, I'm here to read some poetry. So I'm going to start out with a poem that I wrote for uh, my Benicia Poets friends, Benicia Poet friends, who uh, was a good core of poets there. So um, this poem is sort of about um, the making of a poem, you know, for poets. Let the silence reveal this poem in the space between an unperceived stirring invisible pulsing. Let the poem form in the silence, just before. Let the will that grows between the slender blades of grass in the space uninhabited by smooth petals, in the air untouched by hummingbird wings, <coughs> where water forms a pocket let the poem arise seconds before breath. Move toward the word. Into the shadows peer. To darkness leap. I saw the osprey pluck a salmon from the turbulent waters. That is what we do here. Right. So the next poem I'm going to read is um, called Tomas, and it's about a, um, a trip that Monique and I, my wife Monique and I, took to um, Tijuana. And at that time, this is an old poem, and um, I was really into the surrealists, uh, especially Lorca, and the idea of duende. And so I just want to read something really short about what Lorca wrote about duende, which is basically the spirit of art. The duende, then, is a power, not a work. It is a struggle, not a thought. I have heard an old maestro of the guitar say, the duende is not in the throat. The duende climbs up inside of you from the soles of the feet, meaning this. It is not a question of ability, but of true living style of blood of the most ancient culture of spontaneous creation. All right. So that kind of, you know, I'm leading up to something big here, so hopefully this will follow suit. Right. Tomas. The buzzing village beyond the border ants in the thickest bog of Tijuana. A street clenched by chewed leaves, a meager kitchen lit by moths. Chorizo and two of the cates, Tomas brought out his guitar. Wood rubbed smooth by a patina of locusts. His thick fingers evoked blue horses. From his mouth, bright moths and the geometry of birds. Tomas and his guitar were tuned to the lust of subterranean beetles, to the wind scraping its nails along the sidewalk. The plumage of his heart made ours set sail. We blew backward into the night and fell shattered before the moon. Um, I'm going to read a couple of music poem, so that was the first one. And um, this one is about the people I play music with on Thursdays, half of which are here. <laughs> um, we call it the Hoot, and we meet in Oakland. And So this is called Hoot Wings. In the Oakland twilight, the air is heavy with jasmine haze, guitars, mandolin, concertina, a fiddle, Divide the night in perfect servings. Between the moon 
and the floor's dead bees, an amber moth appeared. With an egg beater flurry, silent among the instruments, visually noisy above our heads. Its soft tattoo upon the light bulb, audible only to me and the spider, pianoing silken threads in the rafters. It exit, it exits into a coppery night, into the moth of a bat, dipping beneath the popping stars, skimming the surface of Sossel Creek. This one is um, about my beautiful wife and her mandolin play. Monique's Beautiful Birds. Monique has the ear of a mockingbird, a reverence played with dulcet trills, diphthong throttles, and a swallowtail susserness. Love makes her strings sing. So that all the birds in the neighborhood stop to listen, their wee hearts bursting with delight. She doesn't even realize it, but continues to gather beautiful birds. She didn't even know about that poem. All right. Now I'm going to read from oh, the missing book. Um, a year ago, I ran a marathon, which is 26.2 miles. And um, it was the first time I had done an organized marathon in many years. And I had this idea, you know, one of the many great ideas you have but maybe not follow through with, um, was to, I thought, wow, 26, you know, in my mind bleary state of running many miles, thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great to write 26.2 poems about running? And so finally, when I completed the marathon a, month, uh, uh, a year ago, I was inspired. And so I finally, and I'm running one in four days because I can't get out of this. All right, so um, the first running poem I'm going to read is called Phidippides. Hello. Few runners think of Phidippides, our seminal soldier marathoner, who in 490 BCE, after fighting in battle, ran from marathons to Athens in skinny sandals, proclaimed Nike's victory only to collapse into death without a single sip of Gatorade. Why should we think of Phidippides? We don't run a marathon as a swan song before we slip into the cool gray grave. But he is my hero. He did it. No t-shirt, no corporate sponsor. He crossed the land, fueled by valor, by the blushing pride of victory and an unabashed sense of purpose. So um, because I was doing this crazy thing like running several miles, I wondered like why do I do this? And why do human beings do this? Like where does this come from? So, so I did some research and, and ended up with this poem called Persistence Hunting. Of all primates, only humans run, can run long distances. Even chimpanzees, our closest ancestor, can barely run 100 meters. It is believed that endurance running emerged about 2 million years ago. While most people think that running a marathon is extraordinary, if somewhat crazy, it was the early humans that developed this skill through persistence hunting. Lacking a weapon more deadly than an untipped, sharpened spear, having no stone arrowheads, Hunters would chase an animal for several hours or for even more than a day at times until it collapsed. A galloping quadruped can only breathe once for each stride, like a mo locomotive bellows. As bipeds, we can breathe independently of our stride. Though not as swift, we can vary our running speed, forcing larger animals to overheat and be overtaken by our skinny, stick-bearing ancestors. So began the tradition of the post-marathon meat fest. Right. The next one is about, um, runners in, um, um, 
in Mexico. Um, they are transhumant, which means that they follow um, seasonal migrations of animals, and they care for animals, but they're just gonna do it by following them around. So I'm just fascinated with them, and so this is the Rara Marie. The Rara, Rara Marie of Northern Mexico, named Tarahumara by the Spanish, are exemplary runners. Their name means runners on foot, or those who run fast. They run everywhere and still practice persistent hunting, chasing down deer and wild turkeys until they overheat and collapse. They are barefoot and they wear sandals often sold in old car tires. The Rara Marie are transhumanin and making colorful clothing, and they make colorful clothing from the wool, from the wool of sheep and goats that they tend. They are fueled by tesquino, a corn beer that is made and shared as a social occasion. Because God taught them how to make tesquino, even God drinks it. It is, it is, so it is sacred. It is thought that the tesquino chases our, the large souls within, leaving only little souls, so that they are free to act like children. That is why they run everywhere they go. Speaking of running everywhere you go. As a boy, I ran everywhere. As a boy, I ran everywhere. Around the corner, over fences, down dog snapping alleys, kicking over metal garbage cans, sprinting to the next block, jumping up porches, speeding over hedges, after ringing the doorbells of grumpy old neighbors. Tag always. In the red face sweating, mosquito slapping dust, more frenzied running as street lights flickered on and sticky wet calling from humid cinder porches. A musical, come in now, bleats in the dusk, bolting to the dark end of the street, pretend not to hear. Then surrender to our houses, yellow light leaking onto lawns, black and white television in the corner, colonial furniture, cat fur carpet, shortbread and milk, then sink into the bath, pretending to snorkel, turning the knob, broiling my ankles, hot water running. Right. So I'm gonna read just a couple more running bits. This is called The Architectural Wonder of My Feet. You may boast of the beauty of the Taj Mahal, or be struck dumb by the great pyramids of Giza, with pharaohs performing machinations of dream time with Osiris. Be tickled by the swaying Millennium Bridge in London, with or without the Death Eaters. Express wonderment for the verdant Agora Gardens in Taipei with its luscious architecture but I'm in love with the architecture of my feet. Your book's ready. Okay. So where was I? There I am. All right, so, but I'm in love with the architecture of my feet, with sublime mechanics tied to the calf muscles. Allow me to spring up and propel into the air across the earth with guileless glee, returning me to terra firma, bracing my impact more gracefully than Elon Musk's rocket boosters return to our planet. My feet perform this miracle more than 40,000 times, running 26.2 miles. This next poem, for some reason, no matter who I gave this book to, whatever the age they were, would say, nice ass. So that's the name of this poem, nice ass. Of the many signs from the spectator along the route of the marathon, one read, find a nice ass and follow it. Sound advice, I thought. Whether in an earlier stage of 
human evolution or still walking this side of the turf, few things are more primal than watching an attractive ass move along the earth. Perhaps it helped us focus during persistent hunting. For lack of earbuds, it provides motivation. Developing big gluteal muscles came hand in hand with endurance running. The better we ran, the better butts we got. So, after a successful hunt or ritual Sunday run, well sated from the feast, we form a lap and rest comfortably upon our tired ass. So I grew up in um, Detroit, in Warren, right, right near the border. If you're an Eminem fan and saw that movie Eight Mile, um, I grew up close to there. So we used to run below Eight Mile, which means you go into Detroit. So. Running among the dead. In high school, our cross country train, there was never more than 10 of us, ran into Detroit along Outer Drive and into Mount Olivet Cemetery. Low rolling hills, clipped green lawns, the blush of unabashed youth running among the dead. A hundred years of interred bodies. Some days we'd loaf past a huddle of mourners, weeping, murmuring under heavy gray skies. Once, while veering off the careening blacktop, we came upon a fresh grave a vapor of peat and earthworms rising to meet us. A robin eyed us from a headstone, worm in its beak, blinking. Then a scraping caw, a crow burst in and stole the worm. We stood silent, then shook ourselves, fell into a canter, nothing but our breaths and gentle foot. This next poem um, is for uh, a very good friend, somebody I've known for, I knew for 40 years, and was tragically killed. So I want to read a couple of poems about that, and this is the last running poem, so it's called The Run for Chris. The Run, lung stinging, sigh, thigh singing, a light patchy green and bright appears to always grow, revealing more as we go. But some stop or are taken from the course unexpectedly. We miss the sound of their breath, the rhythmic footfall we know so well, still moves us. So I'm gonna change course and read a Hildegard poem. And um, this poem is called Fisherwoman Cloistered, and it's about the, um, it's about the ritual that um, women go through um, to become cloistered nuns, and they go through this ritual burial, and they're supposed to be dead to one world and then live for Jesus or live for their commitment to their religion, etc. So, um, but because I'm a fishing fanatic, and um, I wrote this book because I sort of, I had the idea uh, about a year ago that I wanted to like rewrite uh, Richard Brodigan's Trout Fishing in America, or do my own kind of version of it. And um, so what ended up happening is um, fishing with Hildegard won't really teach you how to fish. But um, what happens in this poem is that I'm using the idea of this ritual and then um, using Hildegard, who is an avid fisherman in my world, um, uses that in her own way. So there you have it. Fisherwoman Cloistered. In my shadow-sized depression into clay, I descend, supine, eyes to the void, to the constellations, to the quiet lizard 
licking inside my soul. Heart, magnetic north, a small bloom of light in the gloaming of a life now buried. Earth and clods weighed upon my breast, dead to one world, this grave of portal. In the hushed cell, the soil speaks the very first language. Armadillium vulgare, or pilba, makes a rolling passage in the damp earth. Jerusalem crickets, the Navajo call skull insect, beat a rhythmic mating drum that they cannot hear, but feel in their legs the way I feel in this ritual burial. Earthworms accordion their viscous beams through my fingers, born from the veridity of grasses. Their heat pulses through my fingers. Cold clay imprints my knuckles. The earthworm, allworm, moves with the verdant sonic vibrations that bring spring, excite the earth to grow, excites the trout. Once I lance it upon my hook, the all worm will talk to the trout in its mesmerizing dance, so that the trout must ingest the worm to pass on the pulsing spirit of spring. Then I will hook the trout, absorb the electric green energy of the worm, of the trout. Then I will pass this on through the healing arts a light of the fisher woman. So I'm going to read a couple more poems about my good friend who I lost last year. Uh, this is called Timbre. There's a chair missing, a cloud out of place, one less bird in the evening chorus, a bare rectangle where once stood a portrait there's an extra place setting that we want to fill. The timbre of a wine glass not clinked. An erasure of curious, well deep eyes. An absence of laughter we so much need to hear. So this poem is about um, I met Chris in Detroit. We were both mechanical draftsmen working for the auto industry, and uh, we became instant friends. And um, he got married and moved to Minneapolis. I still live in Detroit, but we always got together at least once a year. And we used to meet in the Upper Peninsula and go on these crazy canoeing trips doing all sorts of insane things. And um, we used to meet often at the Fox River, which is where Hemingway used to go and fly fish and stuff. And so this is called Fox River. Miles of river, paddling, or just floating, using the paddle to avoid a bank or protruding log. Our heads fell open. Our hearts, like the river, headed to the ocean. There are those with whom we unfurl, lay, spool bare before the moon. This is about the evening that he passed in the hospital. It's called Wings. Thousands of pairs of wings came fanning voluptuously through the sterile tide, tiles of the hospital. What remained in the bed remained. But the other part rose in a locust lullaby of light toward the summer stars. Those of us around the bed dispersed down the hall, out the door, into some kind of night we had not imagined. Okay. Now for some resistance poetry. <clears throat> this is less so. So this uh, first poem I'm gonna read from my newest book of, called uh, Resistance is Fertile. It's 
called CrowSmart. And kind of originally, it's more of a kind of coming out of a dark place, but um, I also see this as sort of a metaphor for what we're going through in this country. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. All right. Um, CrowSmart. Excuse me, I need it. A murder of crows infiltrated my brain. Not my thoughts, I mean, really, in my head. Calling away to each other in a savage fever pitch. Only when they flap their wings do I get relief. A small clearing in a tangle of woods. Yesterday, when I looked outside, crows punctuated the tree. Their beaks worrying at yet unfurled buds a corvid plan to reduce shade. These bright black birds bring not umbrage, but illuminate this day. Their busy black heads with swift beaks solve for me the darkest part that once obscured a beating heart. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, Hildegard in a bit, but um, Hildegard wrote a lot about different creatures and talked about them in terms of how they are good for healing, what kind of energies they have, etc. So I originally wrote this poem called Lamfrey about, or, as a Hildegard poem, but it became so nasty that it became a resistance poem instead. So there it is, Lamfrey. Chiefly a type of serpent who sucks the light from the weak, while appearing fish-like in its soul, a lamprey is serpentine. It is divisive and antagonistic by nature. Its only creative outlet is lying, as prolifically as a mockingbird imitates, often found seething in the middle of the night. The male is corrosive and detrimental to the female. It is only by violence that the species procreates. In many parts of the world, it is considered an invasive creature, and quite often a great effort is made to prevent its influence. For the sake of life, this lamprey must be impugned. So, you know, um, the other day a friend of mine started a conversation by, you know, you won't be surprised what he who should not be named said, or something like that. And I knew exactly what they were talking about, that I shouldn't be surprised. But at that very second, it occurred to me that we must stay surprised, please. That we must stay freshly horrified at what is going on in this country. Yeah, and that resistance is survival, and that if we think this is normal, then we are fucked, we get consumed, excuse me, bookstore, um, but that we, you know, we get assumed by fascism and it will take root. So we must always be surprised and always question. All right, so there, all right, so that's that part, swamp. To say that you will drain the swamp is a flaccid thought. I know what can come from a swamp, life. Frogs pulse and bellow in the mossy caverns of trees and brambles. Rotting logs give way to exploding clouds of insects. The unabashed sex of flowers swell and sway in the intoxicating twilight. Pollen-laden bees hover in the electric light, while cicadas rev their motors in a deafening auditorium. The gases here bubble to the surface, sublime, divine, not the gas that comes from your rotting, avaricious brain. We will not permit you 
to drain this swamp. You will not impede upon the fertility that we possess. We are the swamp. We are the fecundity of life, art, and a world that requires an array to survive, thrive, and dance upon this perfumed bog. We dance to a music you can't imagine. We carve images in genuflection to the teeming marsh. It travels in us. We are nourished by all that surrounds us. Your vile creatures cannot touch this swamp. You cannot drain what you do not understand. We will continue to grow, to prosper. You are the ephemera. Your end is near. I tend to take the long view and believe that all this social and political crisis will be resolved. And um, I wrote this poem for our, our daughter two years ago. You probably know what day that was that I'm referring to. Okay. So we are the vessels. The sun did actually rise this morning, despite the fearful reports to the contrary. <coughs> The universe and this country will still be fed from its nurturing rays. A vile, hatred creature has risen from the quagmire of fear and ignorance, emboldening the baseless emotion among the tired and lost. Hoodwinked by a sinister demagogue who exists to consume, to dominate, and to bask in his own selfish whims. But the lifespan of hate is limited by its own toxic blood. It is the Ebola of human emotions. While deadly, it is short-lived because it destroys its host. Love, like the sun, regenerates and feeds life, creates poems and art in the human soul. Love. <clears throat> Love is prolific, abundant, and self-sustaining. Love is a vessel to navigate these tempestuous seas. We are buoyant. We will arrive at the shore of a better world. Okay. Proof. All we need is proof that the ship is not sinking. The quick and bright are fellow passengers, not cargo to be jettisoned at the hint of a squall. We began with bright images shining from Laska, a flame we carry in the center, a burning seminal vision to warm us this vessel's passage. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to follow that with, um, I'm working on this longer poem, of which three of the four pieces are done. I, I, I think it's, it's sort of a, um, an invocation to me. And um, so what I did was I, I'm writing about the four elements. And so this poem I just read, and I referred to the cave in Lascaux, I, I'm just kind of searching for a a source in which people have a commonality in which we can all speak to each other. And um, so I'm going to read from this, um, the earth part. So um, this poem called Earth, one of, one part called Earth, um, is meant to be, um, from the viewpoint of somebody witnessing kind of a shaman ritual in caves at the time that it happened for early humans. So there it is. Shaman poets were born in amniotic caves, pulsing to bring to this life our souls sprouting from cave walls pigment reaching from fingertips, truth ineluctable, 
hand of the shaman, hand of the artist, our spirits stir in the chambers of our hearts. In the cave's cool gathering, we enter. The re-entry, knowledge unearthed, wall pressed to our shoulders in dark passage, a glimpse of light returning. Our feet land on wet stone, water leaks around our heads, crisp drops resound. We come here to remember. Pressed further against stone, the last tight turn, the great chamber opens to us. The life-giving light bathes us. Silence ensues as we all sit and breathe together. Take in our brother and sister animals moving on the walls. Shaman starts, low guttural moans. We see a new image upon the wall. Brother Elk has joined us, brought by shaman, as he tells the tale, guiding us back to our animal ancestors who gave us gifts, the first words, to connect us to all animals, to elk, to bison, who sustain, and also to lion and bear, who teach us to be stealthy and wise. In time, we unwind from the great chamber and return to our home. The molten orange sun rising from the earth as a single force, a shared soul, recharged to recognize in each tree their name, their smell, their individual sound as the wind speaks and moves among them. We speak with a common voice, the elk, the bison, and crow who gives us humor. I call upon the earth, the primordial cave, to return to first word. is called my dad. My dad. Smoked lark cigarettes, lit with a Zippo's blue flame. The first smoke, dense blue off the cigarette's tip. I can smell the butane. He's reading the opinion page of the Detroit Free Press. Squarely folded paper into tight column, lips clenched, mouth straight, clears his throat, licks his lips, refolds the paper. Sadie, listen to this. His jaw drops like a drawbridge. His baritone voice raises banners held by tight tendons in his neck, prominent as his voice gets to fever pitch, compassionating current injustices, reaching to articulate what must be. I too can go there so easily, and I have. But now my fever pitches to currents of air, through grasses of light, to currents of ancestral water, where trout and other muses pull me below the surface. OK. So um, I, I credit my parents for me being a poet. And um, not because they're poets, but because they're from Glasgow. and. Um, they have a lot of really clever slang, very funny stuff that my dad said a lot. And um, I don't know if anybody saw when he or she'll not be named was in Britain and the Scottish were um, um, protesting against his presence. And um, if you're there, they were pretty funny. So I was pretty proud of that. So, so anyways, um, this next poem may not be easy to understand because it contains a lot of slang um, but but if you buy the book it is fully annotated so anyways um, and I'm holding up the wrong poem so anyways um, so this is called murder polis or murder polis as they say and it is Glasgow slang which just means like it's general shock or fear 
My dad would just use that term, just, oh, metapolis, you know, something's gone crazy or whatever. So anyways, um, here it is. Hey, you, Chukta, what are you doing in that high office? You bar bag, you have any sausage of sense? You're a right daft idiot, so you are. You know, we monkey kins mad about the workings of a government, heed and shudders above your own daft self. You're just a wee in a jubby in your knickers. You've got wee hands, hair like straw hanging out a midden. Wee flyboy from Airplane Street, as deep and dirty as the Clyde. You couldn't run a menage. You and all your friends gain all the big contracts to break and doing the very things that make this such a great country. We're nae daft, you big gumshie. Do you think our heads are button up the back? We're all wabbed out. All they poor winds you sticking into cages because you can't see any color set white. Ye and all your vile racist friends driving a wedge between all the people of this land. Blowing your vile tweets, blowing away the laws, blowing a smoke screen to blind your daft followers who, who run after you like a bunch of poor wee lemmings. Left without a school to send their wings to a federal debt bigger than your Egypt's idea of a space force. The poor people of Flint can't have a wee drink of water. The poor people of Puerto Rico have near a tooty scone of electricity. And the worst of it is all these evil racist dafties gain room with their white hoods and swastikas, kinning that it's all right to do their vile deeds. I'm talking to you, big eat the breed. You're not an excuse for a man. You're a tea boy for Putin. Oh, we've had enough of you. Just you wait and see. When all is said and done, you'll be greeting for your mom. So I'm going to read some of my fave um, poetry of recent times. <laughs> um, so I have this fascination with Hildegard since as long as I can remember. Um, I mean, first I just thought she was a 12th century composer, you know, recording these absolutely incredible, beautiful pieces. But um, she was many things. Um, she was a, a visionary. She was a mystic. Um, she was a healer, um, she was a physician, she um, healed people both um, psychically, psychologically, as well as physically, and she wrote and was a, just completely attuned to nature. And um, she wrote about everything from rocks to weeds to animals to birds to you name it. So, um, so the first poem I'm going to read is called No Birds. And for me, it's kind of equates, she was a poet as well, but I also feel that this is sort of a, a book about, or a poem about um, a poet, in a sense. No Birds. At a very young age, Hildegard saw things. Mighty, fantastic, terrible, beautiful, mystifying. She heard the songs of birds or angels, songs that lit up the orchard with no birds present. A glimpse of the green man or wood sprite must have seemed normal. Young poets can see sounds, taste color, peripolate in the ecstatic presence of nature. She once described with complete accuracy the spotted markings of an unborn mare to the astonishment of her parents who looked upon their daughter with different eyes. Once it fooled, they too could see the mare. The kaleidoscope of senses received by Hildegard terrified her. When she learned that no one else saw them, heard them, or felt them, she tucked them away as a young poet might do feeling like an albatross among weary sailors in a dead calm. So, um, 
The next poem is called The Green Man. From my first wander into the woods, I knew there was a green man, where light flickers through leaves, ferns nod and fan along a brook's trickle. When glimpsed, he turns sideways, disappears. A hummingbird plucks a sultry to cover his stealthy escape. Within a frog throttle, he winks into coarse, papery grass. Narcissus flowers bow as the green man passes. I cast my line, and a caddisfly curls like a lover's tongue. I catch a quick glimpse of the half man, half tree, before the trout takes the fly, and all is fish, muscle, water, finesse. A wee dance the green man lives for, always near, forever alone. So this next poem is called The Resurrection of the Earthworm. And um, this is about a fishing technique where you cover up a worm with clay and you throw it in the water. And then the splash scares away the trout, but, but um, after a while, um, things calm, and then the mud drips away, and the worm comes out, and then the fish go in and get the worm. But it's about more than that, too. Resurrection of the Earthworm. Per Hildegard's, per Hildegard's instruction, I lance the earthworm, efficiently, but gingerly enough to keep her alive. Take, take fresh clay, take fresh river clay, create an angler's sepulcher, press to my palm, gently cast with a loping toss to keep the worm entombed. Slow click the real lock, Slight slack left in the line. The stream's steady current dissolves the funereal blanket, creating a swirling river banshee of particulate slip in the flexing eddies. The emerging twisting worm sings to a passing trout, who strikes with ancient instinct, pulls the writhing life to itself. I follow with ancestral reflex and draw towards me a fresh pulse, take into my heart this quick life. All right. So more fishing. All right, I'm gonna read a series of haiku. And I do not follow the rule of 575 because kanji and English don't have any true relationship in terms of symbols. I know people get weird about that or whatever, but I don't. As you will notice. All right, Carmen Lake Haiku. I eat the red meat of three quarters of a brook trout. The toolies bow. Steel clouds move in from the north and east. I might get rained on. In the metal blue night, yellow lies, yellow eyes in my flashlights beam. A deer sips the lake edge. This black, sulfurous mud is alive. I hear it breathing, waiting for me. A tiny blue butterfly lands on my throat bloated, my throat bloated belly. Say that five times. A yellow hooded blackbird wail in the oppressive heat. Clouds over the mountain lake come toward me, giant mollusks. The first fish caught with my new rod fights heroically. The, common mate, the comic mating ritual of blue-beaked ducks, the laughing female lifts her tail. The fish I thank for feeding my family bites a hole in my fish bag. The earth invites lightning. The trout rise. I consider fishing. A trout in the shadow erupts. Rattled geese flee. The storm is here. Nowhere to go but in the tent to read Blake. 
I'm going to get drunk. The tempest screams in every corner. I can't fish. The longest roll of thunder I have ever heard. Still, the birds chortle. Burning sagewood at the campfire, a thousand prayers to the sky. Descending the mountain, muscles singing, pains delight. I miss my family. Okay. This is about trying to watch shooting stars and then something else happens. Ear to the viscous highway. He was lying in the damp ground, looking up at the stars, hoping to eye a meteor. The quadratids were in proximity. 95 meteors an hour were expected. The garden was making a sucking music, like 900 snails fucking. He considered the life of a banana slug, like driving a car in perpetual slow motion beautifully hydroplaning on your own saliva. You are the car, and your tires are tongues. You get to lick every detail of your world. Your antenna describe the wind. The only radio station you get is the sound of decaying leaves. To a banana slug, this is Beethoven. He didn't see a meteor, but the glistening tracks of the slug trails formed a delicate crystal lid, crystal web, reflecting starlight and slowly streaked across the garden. So this spring, um, a hummingbird built a nest hanging from a string of bells that Manik got in Thailand. Like, top bell literally was like that big around, and it was probably like a foot and a half from the top of my, inside of my porch. And we realized that this hummingbird built a nest up there. Um, anyways, I, um, I'd never seen a baby hummingbird before. And I was trying to, I mean, I was refused to go up there. I didn't want to disturb it. But I'm thinking, how big are, I mean, how big are they? Like mosquitoes? I mean, <laughs> you know, hummingbirds are so small. But apparently I'm wrong about that. They're like an inch when they get born. But anyways, I got to observe the first flight of a hummingbird, and it was just lovely. Hummingbird's first flight. Its sharp black needle beak tipped cloudward, thumb, thumb sized. Shuttered feathers to appear more like a cloud. It flexed, fledged, and the wing motors started. Lifted, a new helicopter, a fat bumblebee, moving gaslight, slow nudging a string of beads, a hesitant grip, then, air, then airborne again. I feel that way in my dreams. My forearms and hands keep me afloat. I clutch a branch just enough to launch again. Each rise more steady until leap becomes flight. So this is about those perfectly preserved bodies that people find in like Scotland and Ireland and such. In the bogs, it's called the mirror in the bog. The susurrant music of the trees lulled me deeper into the fost, into the moss festooned forest. Ladybird beetles expose mechanical wings and lift in a deafening machinery of emotion. Earthworms expand and contract in an accordionic progression that to the mole is a scraping sandpaper shuffle. Moles know moist music is best. Avoiding potato bugs is a chess game performed in the dark. Salamanders imitate leaves and serpentine slither soundlessly through a moss tumble of stones. In the bog, perfectly intact bodies trick time, 
smirk through an ancient mirror. We pass brief, briefly above, lightly, ever looking forward, occasionally snap a selfie by the cypress at twilight. So, has anyone ever watched SpongeBob SquarePants? Yes. Well, um, this next poem I want to dedicate to Stephen Hillenberg, who just died a couple days ago, yesterday maybe. Um, he is the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. One of my all-time favorite shows. Anyways, um, I also make fish. I make ceramic fish, and um, I made this fish that I learned is called a sarcastic fringe head. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh my God, this is where he got the idea of when we see those fish, like they're standing or walking around and they have these like big fat kind of lips folded on the side. Um, that's a sarcastic fringe head. But they're not what you think they are. All right, here it is. The sarcastic fringe head has a mirthful mouth of a peculiar clown, eyes of a scientist, and the dress of a jester. It is bristly by nature and will strike jurassically if you violate its personal space. It is not suited as a spirit animal for those who jump in marrow deep to those Ilka and heart. But it wears motley so well, I am fooled that it prefers humor over horror. So just to explain, when you see this fish, it looks really innocuous. It's actually not that big. And they're right off the coast over here, actually. And um, they're not very big, but um, this cartoon mouth that you see, it will open like, like, that's why I say Jurassically. It's really, really aggressive if you screw with it. And very nasty, it has all these nasty teeth. You saw a picture of it, open. Google it, it'll freak you out. All right, if you need to be freaked out, there it is. All right, um, a couple more Hildegard poems, and then a few more, and then I'm going to invite you out. All right, so, um, Hildegard's Orb and the Trout. My first encounter with Hildegard was in a Michigan swamp. The wet leather bubbling croak lathering the leopard frogs, cicadas pulled the landscape into a knot. Steam and darkness rose out of the quagmire, pulled by a dray of insects, pulsing low, scraping high. Night treacled to the pop of fireflies consumed me. One hovered close and became an orb. Within a minnowy illuminated woman, blue, knotted, radiant, speaking the language of the swamp, pulsing like a firefly, song of the tree fry, song of the tree frog, eyes of a fly, and a woman's well deep eyes at once. Everything went void silent. In the air above me, caddisfly patterns appeared when a trout I max theater size mouth at fly gingerly. I thought, raise the rod tip skyward, set the hook. Hildegard's orb extinguished. The only sound was vapor leaving my mouth. Hildegard finds a blackbird. The day was golden, the sky sapphire. A shadow crossed her path, a winged wheeze of a passing blackbird. It dropped in mid-flight and fell into the undergrowth. 
Hildegard lifted up, lifted the bird, its body softly quaking. She looked into the bird's eyes. She saw waves of what the bird saw. She saw her first flight, landing on a birch log at the edge of a swamp. Orange dragonflies drawing aerial geometry. Cicadas wind, winding a tight clock. She pulled a bug out of the birch bark. A frog stirred the surface of the green water. Then the picture changed, and she saw the bird's first clutch of young landing on a blossoming blackberry bramble. A falcon fell like a dark angel, and to her horror, snatched a chick and flew off. Her body quaked as she held Hildegard's gaze. Now it was morning, and the blackbird dipped her beak into a finger trickle of cool water, worried a wee slug from under a blue stone, flew above the forest canopy to see the curve of the earth. She felt lighter as she traveled, slowly coming closer to the land below. And she saw near a bend in the river a small woman, radiant in the verdant grasses, she no longer knew how to fly and fell close to the woman who picked her up and now gently returning her to rich black earth. So as I said earlier, I'm working on this four part poem about the four elements. So I'm gonna read two more of them and then have a rousing last one We'll all go have a beer. How about that? All right. So, um, air. A slight current bends hair on the back of my hand, runs up my arm. The wind combs long fields of alfalfa in S's that lap the landscape. Crows mock words as they arc like smirking black angels. Joy and fear enter, inflame, move on, the way muons manage to pass through us, undetected, source and destination unknown. Breath sucked from the first bum smack, air gives voice to words, the first word pushed out. The treble clap swallowed. The treble clap arc of the swallow stops my breath. The drop fall throttle of hummingbirds bleat at the bottom out of a 20 meter plunge, then hover like an uncloaked starship. Their infinite loop of wings, fans, flower petals as they dip in for nectar like my love sipping tea. The condor hangs in stillness. The great shadow stirs the savannah it's in its carrion quest. Who was the first to laugh? Crow, and it was grad. I call upon the air to fortify my next word, give lift to my wingless body, wandering here, terror bound, cumbersome. Take a deep breath. The earthworm ventilates the soil in lightning streaks of drilling through the earth. Birds eat the worm in praise, return it to the sky. Water. I am walking toward the water but the water is inside me, rising and falling. Good souls that neither walk nor swim live here in the clenching void, remain as alluvia in my chest, tidally pressed and blur my vision. I blink away the water from which there is no escape. We spend years inside water staring into its depth, 
It swirls us into eddies, drifting through, falling and rejoining in the liquid fabric of the river, endlessly unraveling around us. The water folds into itself, describing the earth in its return to the sea. September salmon. An arc of red in the antelopine fever of touch, brush, and breath of union, meandering in magnetic, the river's course folding upon each body, the intimacy of a body deconstructing, spawns each particle of light, day inflamed by red bone demarrowing, salmon wears the ritual mask in a final fevered cut through the moon, a singular death in effulgence of light. While the house falls apart, shingle by shingle, windows explode and meat falls off. Trees lean over the water, leaves bursting into flames, disintegrate to reopen the sky. I call upon the water to rise up, loosen from the choking mire, our marooned vessel. All right. All right. All right. Um, a toast. Let us raise our glasses to the vulgar tyrants, the oppressors, the avaricious bankers who bear their wicked teeth. Yes, let us raise our glasses to those that deny gravity and live on the flat earth of their medieval morality. Let us drink to those who have given birth to the resistors, to the buds that unfurl before our eyes, to the children who will inherit a new dawn. Mahogany, ochre, chocolate, charcoal, cream, ivory, freckled, sienna, green eyes, black eyes, brown eyes, blue. Every voice in every language, arm in arm, dance around this rising fire. May the flames do their good work. Let us clink our glasses, toss back amber liquid, smash them, into the fireplace, let the glass explode into a million tiny shards that spreads in a new constellation across the night sky. Thank you all very much. So anyone who's interested, I have books for sale. And those who are not interested in that, if you're interested in the beer, we're going to go over to EJ Fairs after and have a delicious pint. So you're welcome to come along. I hope you do. Thank you again for coming. I appreciate it very much.